offshore oil company, Sink. Now, um, there's two oil fields that are that they're trying to exploit this oil from, um, Tilenga and Kingfisher in the western part of Uganda. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay. If you are off, off of mute, if you can mute yourself, that would be great. Um, and the majority of this oil will be exported. Um, so there's, um, you know, there, this is a, this is a question of where, you know, the, the oil is there, we're in the middle of a, as you know, geopolitically, um, there's a lot of, um, interests to not take oil and gas from Russia, um, in, in Europe. And so a lot of, a lot of countries are now trying to get more oil from other parts of the world. Um, so this it's, it's very important to note that most of the oil won't be will will be sh will be sold back to the Ugandans or the Tanzanians, um, but a lot of it also will be just simply exported. Um, as I said before, it's going to be the longest heated crude oil pipeline in the world, and scientists have called it a carbon bomb. It's you know just going to be a disaster for the environment. Um, it's already a disaster for the people living there. There's um, and Joseph will talk a little bit about the displacement that's happened. Um, and um, and as well as the destruction of uh, the natural habitat that we've seen, um, and it's important to note that you know these companies have to export the oil out for it to be commercially viable on the on the in the market. And without the pipeline, the oil drilling is just not possible. Um, I'm going to give a quick. This is all very. Brief information. Joseph's going to give us a little bit more, but this is basically how the um, the finance, um, how the financing of the pipeline is working. Um, you can you may be able to see. Maybe it's too small. There's two oil pipeline, two oil fields, Kingfish and Tilenga. Um, they're going to be operated. Sixty two percent is owned by Total Energies of France. Um, Eight percent is owned by the China National Offshore Corporation. And 15% um, uh, each um, is owned by the Tanzanians and the Uga Uganda National um, Oil Companies. So the the main the main um, owner is the French, um, and they're um, they're trying to build this big, big pipeline through the country. Um, ECOP needs a loan and it needs insurance, right? So. Basically, um, the campaign, there was a campaign that started in 2021 um, when uh, communities in, in Uganda and Tanzania were starting to speak out about the destruction um, that this pipeline would cause to their communities. Um, and there was a lot of evidence gathering. Um, there was like some mobilization and they started reaching out to international partners um, who started to, to started to work with them to build some legal strategies and finance strategies. Um, and there's a, there's a lawsuit that's happening in the French courts right now um, to stop the, the construction. And originally it was to stop the construction. Now it's to at least get compensation for those people who have been displaced. But the big piece has been the finance and insurance advocacy work. Um, on the on the stopecop.net website, um, you can find even the list of banks and insurance companies that have been targeted. Um, right now, the campaign has been very successful. There's 27 major commercial banks and 28 major insurance companies have said no to ECOP. So that's something that we want to celebrate and uplift <clears throat> um, because this is, we, we're seeing this is a winnable campaign uh, with all the pressure and the organizing that has happened on the ground in, in Uganda and Tanzania, um, you know, and in with support of international allies, uh, they, we have been able to stop um, the, the, the pipeline from getting the funding it needs. And without the funding, you know, it's going to be hard to actually build this pipeline. They're already starting to build some of the pieces, but they're not going to be able to finish it. And each year and each quarter that passes, um, they keep increasing the cost of the pipeline. So originally they needed, they were looking for 3 billion in loans. Now it's gone up to 5 billion. So, which is a, it's a good thing. The good thing is that as the cost increases, you know, there's going to be more public outrage and international scrutiny. Um, so, you know, um, this is just a very kind of a quick overview of, of the, how the campaign is, what, what's happening in um, in Uganda. But I want to pass it to Joseph to kind of explain a little bit more about 
the background of what has happened um, up to now, and then a little bit about like why it's important that we join this fight. So Joseph, can you hear me? And yes, I can hear you. Thank you very much, uh, Nicole, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, well, uh, you gave me three talking points. What's the current organizing on the ground looking like? Uh, what's the, what is the security situation for ECOP organizers in Uganda and Tanzania? And why it is, is it so important for all of us to take action against ECOP? Um, and what excites me about building allies from different parts of the world? Those are the four talking points that you asked me to talk about, and I'm going to try to stick to that. Um, it's good that you've talked about much of ECOP, so I'm, I'm actually going to save uh, a lot maybe for our action on the 26th. So everyone, <laughs> if you want to hear a lot about ECOP and what is happening about ECOP, please come to our action on the 25th and 26th. The 26th is a big action, and on the 25th they have uh, an, e an evening uh, session uh, where we, we explore some of these issues. Well, so uh, there have been a lot going on uh, in terms of organizing uh, around ECOP uh, since 2021, as uh, Nicholas uh, indicated. But uh, since May, uh, May 27th in Uganda and Tanzania, uh, some of the project on the 25th, the project affected persons went to uh, had like a press conference and talked about how they've been affected. Um, and uh, they took statements uh, both in Uganda and Tanzania. And on, uh, that was Africa Day. So to commemorate, commemorate that. And on the 27th, uh, both in Uganda and Tanzania, um, the activists and some of the affected persons uh, went to uh, held an action demonstrated at Chinese embassies in Uganda and Tanzania. Uh, in Uganda, seven activists were, were arrested at the Chinese embassy. And what was interesting, the Chinese officials, Chinese embassy officials were actually looking and taking pictures. So that was quite interesting. Um, and of course, in Uganda, it's, it's important to know the CINO, um, uh, as Nicole explained. Uh, CNOC is a Chinese company that is uh, being, uh, exploring oil, uh, and Lake Albert, and, and Total is a major shareholder in the pipeline. So there are two ownerships. Uh, I want to clarify this. The pipeline is mostly owned by the French uh, company, 62%, as uh, Nicole has, has indicated, and 8% by China, and then 15 15 by Tanzania. But the actual oil wells, share of both the Chinese, uh, it's much higher for the Chinese uh, in terms of the actual where the oil is being built. Uh, it's maybe like 30 something percent uh, Chinese owned and then the West, or maybe even more. So so there are two different components of that. But where the Sinop is operating around, along Lake Albert, there's a lot of human rights abuses. The army is confiscating boats and, and uh, displacing uh, citizens. And, and, and uh, of course, the same thing is happening within uh, the French uh, areas of operation, but uh, within the China areas of operation has been much more pro pronounced. So, uh, so they that's why they chose to go to the Chinese embassies to demonstrate because the human rights abuses are more pronounced. Even though, of course, the French are going to do much more damage by building a pipeline. So, on the twenty seventh, they demonstrated in Uganda, and thirty seven were, were arrested, um, uh, and I think they spent about a week. In jail and abuse and, and all types of uh, abuses uh, happen to them. Uh, that's not to mention the human rights abuses that people that have been displaced by the activities in, in Uganda. Or, uh, uh, people have been displaced from their land, uh, they can't farm, their children are, are falling out of school because they cannot afford to take their children to school, they're not in money. They can't farm their land anymore. Uh, most of these people are farmers. Uh, now they are jobless and, and I mean, yeah, basically jobless, uh, uh, no food, and some are in refugee camps, internally displaced people's camps. So it's a huge effect and uh, the water's being polluted and all that. So it's a big problem. So on June 3rd, another activist, uh, very outspoken activist on ECOP was arrested in Uganda for six days, uh, was stripped down and beaten unconscious, but because of international pressure, he was uh, released uh, after six days. And then on June 26, this is organized the organizing portion uh, because you asked me to talk about what is happening in terms of organization. On um, June 26, uh, 30 students were arrested. Um, again, June 26 was a global day of action 
uh, in many countries, Uganda, Tanzania, France, Germany, Denmark, South Africa, Nigeria, uh, Netherlands, uh, over 10 countries uh, held demonstrations again at the Chinese embassy because the other portion, which is very important to understand why focus on Chinese embassy recently is because China is a lender as a result. As uh, Nicole has just mentioned, the campaign has been very successful in, in, in the sense that most Western banks and insurance companies have declined to finance and insure this type of because of the activism. But the Ugandan government is now relying on China. And uh, China is announcing very, very soon whether or not they're going to finance this uh, pipeline. And uh, what is actually a bit scary is that on June 13th, uh, the Standard Bank of South Africa uh, announced that they're going to finance ECO. But the Standard Bank, the major shareholder in Standard Bank, is uh, ICBC, the Chinese bank, uh, which is partly state-owned. So that may be an indicator that China is leading, leaning towards financing this pipeline. So that is why the focus on China recently. Um, <clears throat> so again, on the 26th, 30 students in Uganda were arrested. And uh, but because of a uh, major outcry internationally uh, through this, uh, as uh, Beth was talking about collective liberation, uh, you know, that's why it's important for us uh, activists worldwide to speak out and and highlight these issues of climate-related uh, uh, human rights abuses. Uh, these people, these students, were uh, released on within a day. Uh, uh, so it's minutes. been a production. So thank you so much. Uh, with that, uh, that is the organizing. Organizing. Uh, you want to say something, Nicole? Is it my time over? No, just two minutes. You have a two-minute warning. <laughs> okay. Okay. Great. Great. So, so yes, and. I, mentioned, I forgot to mention that also the march to parliament uh, a, few, a couple of days on June, uh, I think, somewhere before before the 26th, uh, students marched to parliament uh, requesting um, the parliament to 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 stop uh, the the eco project. <clears throat> now, uh, in terms of yeah, so that's the security situation. So those two points are kind of bouncing together, and um, it's important for us to take action on ECO because uh, according to international uh, intergovernmental uh, panel on uh, climate change, uh, which is the leading uh, institution uh, on climate science, uh, no fossil fuels should, you know, if we're gonna uh, live within the climate uh, agreement, Paris Agreement, which is no, no rise over, temperatures not rise over five degrees centigrade per, uh, since the industrial revolution, that if you know and, and avoid the effects of of uh, you know severe effects of uh, uh, on the environment and, and and climate, we no fossil fuel projects should be uh, should be uh, developed. So ECOP is one of the major major uh, uh, fossil fuel projects that's happening in in Africa, and none. So we should stand up for any fossil fuel anywhere especially major ones like these ones that uh, can have a major impact on climate change. And of course, the climate change has no borders. Uh, you know, the oil that's exported to the U.S. is found in New Jersey, Total, well, in many places in the world, but Total has a, a refineries in New Jersey and Linden. So, you know, of course, the pollution and all that. So there is no uh, borders with that. So we need to stand up against this uh, uh, collectively, as Beth said, to liberate ourselves from the severe impacts of uh, climate change and uh, fossil fuel uh, burning. So thank you so much. Uh, for now, I think I'll stop there and uh, add, add more later. Thank you so much, Nicole. <laughs> thank you so much to Joseph. Um, just want to give a real, let's give a, a round of applause, put some love in the chat for Joseph. Also, Comrade Hillary has been doing so much work around it around ECOP and what we're trying to, the picture we're trying to present to you comrades tonight is that this is a winnable campaign. There's movement on the ground in Africa. It's a huge pipeline that we must stop, not just, not just out of charity for Africans. No, the Africans are telling us, hey, we need to stop this thing because of, because we, because of the history of colonialism one, but also for the world, we need to stop this thing. So um, I, I think it's very important for us to take away that you know this this is also a, a coalition that's international and that international piece is really um showing up in this country too with our with our coalition so um i want to just remind folks to please 
click on um, get into a channel that you um, you know that you want to participate in because we will have presentations that are not only in English tonight. Um, and we're going to start first. I want to invite our um, our coalition, some of our coalition speakers. We're going to first hear from Beth, um, and then we're going to hear from um, Gigi, and then Mohiba, um, and then Molly. Um, so I know Beth has to hop too pretty soon. Um, so Beth, I don't know if you're already on your other call, um, but if you wanted to come off, um, you have five minutes. Um, each speaker will have five minutes to kind of explain why they're here in the struggle um, to, to stop ECOP. Um, so Beth, if you're ready, we'll go to you. Absolutely. Let me, um, yeah. Hi, uh, everyone. Jumping back on here and wanting to share where Movement for Black Lives, the Black Hive stands, some of the work that we've done. Um, if you hear a, a six-year-old in the background, that is my daughter, Luna, and so um, we just go and work right through. Um, but definitely want to speak to what Joseph shared and what I kind of started on the call with the grounding. Um, give me one second. Let me lower that volume. Yes, organizing with children. <laughs> yes, organizing with children is a lifestyle that we need to document more of <laughs> and share in practices. <laughs> um, but wanted to kind of name one of the, the elements of, of why we are rooted in the work that we do and how we show up and, and our morals and our values and how our dream of collective liberation contributes um, to this space. And so the Black Hive has... Um, over the years created a black climate mandate, um, which we uh, believe have shared. Um, but that element is kind of a breakdown of like all the policies, all the ways that black and folks uh, and, and diasporic uh, folk are most impacted by the climate crisis. Oh, thank you, Nico. And it talks about what can be done um, for a policy level here in the state and most recently in the most recent COP, kind of spreading that and offering the Black Climate Mandate to other countries and growing that expansion um, through there. For me personally, I am, uh, I identify as Black because I grew up in this country. I was born in America um, and my parents are originally from Ethiopia. And so they migrated here in the 1970s um, and started their families here. So this understanding of how it's impacting us here because of where I grew up and also connected to my culture. All of my family is still in Ethiopia and Addis Ababa um, and understanding those connections of um, the ways that if we are not speaking within our communities about what is going on on the planet, um, we're not going to understand the cat the catastrophe. Thank you, Candace. Um, unless we are talking and in spaces and in community together. And so Black liberation is the, the Black and diasporic liberation. Liberation of the African continent is key to our climate crisis. Um, recently, there have been videos that have been created um, that are sharing that the, the Congo Basin is one of our biggest lifelines and how this kind of moving towards climate justice is so important and, and being able to support and protect the assets that the, the 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 environmental elements that we have and so understanding that importance understanding that those are the individuals that are being impacted most um is very important um tying it back to our, our big reason here so it's what we stand for it's what our work does we have um, over 200 organizations and through m for bl that's working on that. And um, it's it's rooted to and through the Black Climate mi Mandate and the work that we do. And so, yeah, we're, we're honored to be in partnership. We're honored to grow those relationships. And we're honored to uh, root in collective liberation through the lens of Black liberation through our end. Uh, amazing. Yeah. Let's let's give some love to Beth in the chat. Thank you so much, um, Beth. 
Um, now we're going to go to Gigi, um, Comrade Gigi from the Chinese Student and Activist Network um, about why they're mobilizing. So come on over, Gigi. Hi, Nico. Um, thanks for having me and for organizing me to this coalition. Um, I think coming from organizing Chinese diaspora community, we often being caught up as like, China versus the West, particularly China versus the U.S., seeing each other's oppositions, ideologically speaking, politically speaking, and the roles they can play. So I think often, I think the ECOG campaign shows us they are not, it helps us to see a more fuller pictures and a more complicated and a real pictures of often states they are not really having people's as their best interest. They have their own interest that's often led by capitalist interest. And um, not, neither countries or the states are really generally concerned with human rights violations. And they paint those attacks of human rights violation and dismiss that of what they are actually doing. And... Um, they not only they are not a sometimes they've often been pit as competitor, but they actually through the eco campaign that data is that Joseph and Nico have shared us they deeply embedded it in this shared interest in exploiting the local resources and displacing indigenous people's community. And I think we need to have this cross movements and cross struggle learning opportunity how help us to learn and be critical of those states, especially critical of like non-Western states, the banks and insurance companies, um, the role they've been playing. And um, so I think diaspora organizing, the work that Joseph and Nico has been organizing all of us here is because diaspora community bridging us by connecting the dots that help us to realize this fuller, bigger picture to tell us what's actually going on on the ground and broadening our movements, acting in real solidarity. I think that's also the reason why, like, while those U.S.-China tension often being talked in the U.S., in foreign policy world, the social justice movements here, we don't really know much or talk about China in a progressive internationalist perspective. So I think the Stop Epoch campaign really helped us to learn and to build that grassroots bottom-up um, solidarity, movement to movement work and help us to each other to learn from it. And, and then learning that how movements in different places are structured differently because the conditions, the environment they face are differently. And, and it helps us to complicate our analysis and also helps us develop better and more creative strategies in combating multiple, um, power forces so and and also because our communities are also very young and very underdeveloped and the, to learning more about movements and from the eco campaign will be really helpful for us to learn and to build with the other transnational and diaspora community and we really appreciate learning from each other so this is why we want to be here and partner with um, multiple diaspora groups Thank you so much, Gigi. Um, let's give some love to Gigi in the chat. Uh, beautiful words, um, helping us like make, make those links, make those connections um, as we move forward in this coalition. Um, so thank you so much, Gigi. Um, next, I'm gonna invite Mohiba to come on. Um, Mohiba, I don't, I don't know if you're also interpreting as well, um, but let's see if, are you able to come off? Can you hear us? I, I think Mohiba, are you also a Kazi, right? <laughs> okay, I, I think we have to um, maybe get you out of the interpretation mode for a second. Um, let's see, Jeff, can you, um, yeah, Jeff, can you come on to the screen real quick? Um, and we're going to have to go into the, if you want, you could make me host for a second. So I can try to figure this out. Uh, 
give us one second. And while we're doing that, welcome to Marlena. Marlena is um, with the Summer of Heat and is going to be speaking soon. We're going to figure out this interpretation thing for a quick second. Um, and so we can have Mohiba um, come on. Um, let us... Okay, Mohiba, you should be in the main now, not as an interpreter. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, and, and you're going to be speaking in, in uh, Urdu, is that correct? No, I'll be speaking in English, and there is another Urdu interpreter who is interpreting right now. Afterwards, I'll put you back as an Urdu interpreter, um, but you have five minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you to Drum for being here. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much. Um, I am uh, really happy to be here uh, with all of you comrades. Uh, warm greetings of solidarity from the working class, South Asian and Indo-Caribbean communities organizing to build power to you, our African comrades and allies. We are inspired by the Ugandan and Tanzanian people's fight to defeat the East African crude oil pipeline that has and continues to threaten to displace your peoples and destroy your lands, water, and environment. We see and honor you, your people, and homeland on the line to stop ECOP from fueling the capitalist machine that plunders in the interest of profit for corporations and the elite few. We link arms with you uh, in saying no. No to the drilling, displacement, and destruction of the ECOP project. No to the stealing of 1.7 billion barrels of oils that should stay deep in the grounds of the earth. No to the exploitation of total energies and the Chinese national offshore oil company so that they may line their pockets with billions of dollars of oil money. No to the violation of your sovereignty and autonomy over your indigenous people, lands, waters, and non-human relatives, and no to the continuation of imperialist extraction for profit that threatens our life on our shared planet. We add our community's voices to the growing international demand and ECOP. When your people are under attack, we stand with you to fight back. We know that our struggles are one and interconnected. Like you, our peoples in Bangladesh, Pakistan, Nepal, Guyana, Trinidad are harmed by foreign domination, imperialism, and capitalist projects that reduce our lives to investments, profit margins, and coins. Like you, um, our people and homelands contribute the least to the human cause climate crisis, but disproportionately suffer the impacts. In recent weeks, temperatures in Sindh, Pakistan reached 52 degrees Celsius, around 130 Fahrenheit. These are extreme conditions, not meant for human life to thrive. In Guyana, Exxon has its tendency, uh, tentacle set on drilling offshore um, uh, for new fine oil reserves. While multi-billions will be made from this project, the impoverished people of Guyana are sold out. In Nepal, there are more and more floods, landslides, glacial floods. Mount Everest is melting, and at its path are the ancestral homes, farmlands, and roads of our people. In Bangladesh, women's health and ability to have children are shifting because of climate catastrophes wreaking, wreaking havoc on their bodies. The flooding and cyclones are happening more frequently. By 2050, entire communities and regions will be underwater. And after leaving our homelands, by, when we look for survival and find ourselves in places like New York City, we continue to be impacted by the heat waves, the air pollution, the flooding, the racism, the criminalization, and economic precarity. Like you, African comrades, our people are the target of imperialist destruction. To this, all of this, we say no more. We join you in the front lines at the center of our fights to stop ECOP, stop the plunder of our homelands, stop the displacement of our peoples, stop imperialist climate destruction of Uganda, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Brooklyn, and the Bronx. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Wow. Let's just give so much love to Mohiba in the chat. Um, and just, yeah, 
y'all are just blowing blowing us away. Thank you so much. Um, uh, it's yeah. Um, I'm going to not talk anymore because I just we can't can't follow that. But I want to um, end us with um, for this section with Molly from 350 Brooklyn. Um, and while Molly's speaking, I'm also going to add Mohiba back into interpretation. So, so special love to Mohiba for interpreting and for presenting as well. So um, Mo Molly, go ahead. Welcome on. Okay. And Molly has done so much helping to put this whole thing together. So much appreciation. <laughs> hey, everyone. Um, it's so good to be with you all. I'm excited that we have 44 people on this call and the very different communities that are coming together. It's very inspiring. Um, at 350 Brooklyn, uh, we have a people versus fossil fuel work group and we joined this campaign last fall. And we spent a good amount of time talking about why we wanted to commit to this. And so I wanted to share some of that with you. Um, we feel like the campaign really broadens the vision of our movement. Uh, this is a global campaign. And, you know, just as we see these international capitalists come together to do this pipeline and, and they are all competitors, we are all aligned and we can come together to fight this. And so we found it very inspiring and encouraging to 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 work more on a global level and to think about our movement on a global level and try to, to do that more often um, because it, it's really encouraging and inspiring. Um, the tremendous damage that the pipeline will do, uh, you know, just is devastating. It, it really, uh, really was frightening to look at and to see the displacement of people, the loss of homes, the loss of livelihoods, um, the destruction of Lake Victoria, the source of drinking water and, and, and fish and food and ecosystems. You know, we had to admit that there's a level of fear that motivates us to, to act because it, it really is so, uh, catastrophic that we felt like on a gut level, we, we really wanted to be involved. Um, we also know that the activists in Uganda and Tanzania risk a lot more when they take action. You know, as, as Joseph talked about, they risk arrest, they risk harassment, they risk, uh, torture. I mean, it's very significant what, what it it takes from them to be active. Whereas, you know, in New York City, at least for now, we have the right to protest. And uh, in Summer of Heat, I think so far, maybe 200 people have been arrested. And we can do that. And that makes a difference. Um, and other people can't do that. And so we want to stand up and, and fight and be loud in our support of this campaign, in part for that reason. Um, it also brings together all of the intersectional issues of the climate crisis. And as a community from the North, we feel a sense of responsibility to to speak out, to organize, to uh, to name this for what it is, which is a, another story of imperialist extraction, plunder, destruction. It's nothing new. It's that same story again and again, and we need to speak out against that. Um, we think it's a smart strategy. Um, the process that they do of focusing on the banks and insurance companies to to get them to make a public statement that they will not fund uh, the pipeline has been really effective. You know, if if you, I, I don't think there's many campaigns that can say twenty eight banks and twenty seven insurance companies. Um, have declared they will not fund this. So I think it's really effective. And I think 
we can have a big impact. I mean, this is a case in which social media can be very powerful. The photographs of people taking action over this pipeline in New York City, you know, the, the one of the capitals of international finance really hits them hard and, and it busts the brand on a level that these fossil fuel companies really hate. And, and so I think we really can be effective. And we just feel this is a campaign we have to win. We have to have everyone saying stop ECOP all over the planet um, and, and show that, that our movement can stop the greatest pipeline and that, that we are more powerful together and that we can do this and, um, and we can win and not, uh, last but not least, uh, we have our own app, which is uh, called Chile, and it is about um, the campaign and other climate issues, but it's something that you want to check out. So thank you very much. Sorry if I went over time. No, oh, that's that's great, Molly. Thank you so much. Let's give some love to Molly in the chat. Um, and if you want to drop that app for Chile, the Chile app link um, or how people can access that, that's great. We've heard so many amazing um, interventions from our coalition speakers. Uh, like, I don't know about you. I'm feeling super excited, super motivated. Um, we're, we were going to I had scheduled in a little break, but we're actually since we're on time, we want to go straight into hearing um, um, uh, Molly mentioned the summer of heat. This is ECOP uh, week is part of the summer feed. And I'm going to um, pass it to uh, Comrade Marlena to give us, um, if you can, a little bit less than five minutes about the summer feed and why we're, why we're doing this. Everyone, good evening. Um, I will try to speak quickly. Um, I'm so honored and grateful to be on the call with all of you. Um, a little bit about me. I work with Climate Defenders. I'm part of the Summer of Heat campaign. Um, I just feel so um, such deep admiration for the incredible work of Ugandan activists who are standing up and fighting ECOP. Um, we have learned so much from them and are really grateful to be able to stand in solidarity. Um, the Summer of Heat campaign is a campaign of nonviolent civil disobedience and action um, to stop the flow of money from Wall Street into fossil fuels. It's a campaign here in New York City where Wall Street lives, um, and it's running from June through the end of August. So we are doing actions. Um, some weeks we've done more than six actions in one week um, to really put pressure on these decision makers on Wall Street and in New York City who are choosing conti to continue to support the build out of fossil fuel infrastructure. All right, just um, to slow down just a little bit, Marlena. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I won't talk that fast. <laughs> uh, yeah, let me slow down. Um, so it's already been an exciting summer so far. Over 6,000 people have signed up and committed to take action. 115 organizations have signed on to support. Over 300 people 350 people have engaged in nonviolent civil disobedience and um, risked arrest and have been arrested. Um, all the cases have been thrown out so far, and thousands of people have already been in the streets. Uh, the summer campaign, uh, the summer of heat campaign, is for me really a movement rooted in love for our families and our communities and our world. Um, we also intend to win. We want to force concessions from our opponents on Wall Street, including the insurance, um, in including insurance companies. And we know that fossil fuels and climate destruction go hand in glove with imperialism, racism, and violence. Um, part of the, sum the goal of the summer of heat is to really root the campaign in some of the key fights against fossil fuels and add our voices um, to the chorus of pressure trying to stop these projects or end these projects. And so for us, um, and I think for so many activists around the world, um, Stop ECOP is one of those really, really key, um, like one of those key projects that we want to shut down. And I think we can do it. And I think some of these, com these insurance companies, um, it's just incredible to see them already um, being forced to move and to drop ECOP. And so we're really excited to take action um, in just a couple of weeks to continue that trend. 
and continue to put pressure on those insurance companies. So I don't know, Nico, if there's anything else I should say. I know we're at 759, but just excited to, to work with everyone on this. Super excited. Thank you, Marlena. Let's give some love to Marlena. She's been working super hard with all the summer feet team over the summer, and they've got a lot going on. So really appreciate you for supporting this, um, this fight. Um, and yeah, please give some love to Marlena. Um, we're going to uh, pass it to Alice um, from 350 Brooklyn to talk about who is our target for the ECOP days of action. Um, and so Alice, if you are here, Please come on and um, Hi. we have five minutes. Thank you, welcome. Great, yeah. Um, so I'm specifically talking about uh, AIG and why they are the talk, the target for the Stop ECOP campaign on 726. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad to talk to everyone here. Um, but one of the things that I've, I've really learned this year, which is the importance of the insurance industry in the climate crisis. No pipeline project anywhere in the world can begin without insurance. And we've had more wins by targeting the insurance industry because the damage caused by climate change has directly hurt their profits, making them more vulnerable to pressure. AIG, which stands for the American International Group Incorporated, remains one of the top 10 insurers of the fossil fuel industry. The Insure Our Future campaign, and um, I think someone will put the link to that in the chat so you can check that out, um, which tracks global insurance campaigns, found that AIG collected more than an estimated $500 million in premiums on an estimated estimated $24.2 billion in fossil fuel investments. It's a startlingly contradictory situation. Supporting fossil fuels remains big business for AIG, despite the increasing harm caused by climate change, which caused them to announce that it would curb home insurance sales to customers in some 200 zip codes across the US because of climate change. The good news is that we are winning. A total of 28 insurance companies have already ruled out insuring ECOP. Only seven insurance companies that have the capacity to insure a project of this scale um, have not ruled out insuring ECOP. We are winning 28 to 7, and we need to make sure that AIG commits to not insuring ECOP and feels the heat for the fossil fuel companies they do support. I'm excited that on July 26th, we will march and make noise and have some civil disobedience and let the employees and the public know that AIG is in fact insuring climate death and disaster at its international headquarters in Midtown Manhattan. Um, I don't know if I'm at time yet, but that's pretty much all that I have to say for for that information. So you have two more minutes if you want to. Move on to next. Sorry, what was that? No, you did. You did. You, you did great. You're under time and it's perfect. So um, let's give a okay. big to Alice um, for giving us a little bit of an explanation of why we're hitting up AIG. So um, really appreciate your activism and, and your, your knowledge you're bringing to this campaign, Alice. Um, I'm going to share my screen again, and we're going to move along. Yes, please don't forget to give some love to Alice um, in the chat. So um, now we're getting to, um, you've heard about the campaign You've heard some updates from the ground. Um, you've heard from our coalition partners. Uh, you've heard about the summer of heat and why AIG is their target for the days of action. Now it's time to talk about the what we are planning to do. So after this quick review on the slide, uh, we'll head straight to breakout groups. Um, so on July 25th, which is a Thursday, um, the summer of heat organizers have graciously lent us their temporary headquarters in Dumbo, Brooklyn. 
Uh, we're calling the day the Global South Rises Against Fossil Fuels. Uh, we plan to set up early, um, like 9 a.m., and begin with artwork. If you can't make it that early, that's okay. Um, you know, we're we're hoping we're hoping for some good art. We'll see what happens. Um, if you're an early riser or plan to get to NYC early, we will have some fun artwork for you and the family to do. Um, then starting in the afternoon, we're totally we're not clear exactly when, maybe two or three, and we will check in with everyone to see what works best for people. Uh, we will plan to begin programming um, and go through the evening. Um, we welcome your ideas. Um, and are still working with, you know, coalition partners to design the day. But the vision is to have converse, more conversations like this between us, um, between us and with comrades from Uganda and Tanzania, time zones permitting, um, as well as having, you know, a nice dinner to bring us together and perhaps some cultural time in the evening. Um, we also are going to need to stick to some very um, good COVID protocols, comrades. Um, so be prepared. Um, of course, we will also have some um, logistical planning sessions for the action um, in the street on the 26th, uh, along with any legal briefings. Um, this will be really a moment to come together in person um, to continue to build our joint politics and to celebrate and to prepare for taking action. How does that sound? Let's let's see some stuff in the chat. If it sounds good to you, you know, make it make it happen. <laughs> Say that. Um, there's a link, I think I put a link in there where you can find the most update information about ECOPS Days of Action. Um, it's um, the one that has uh, summerofheat.org slash week seven. Um, then on the 26th, we're going to take action. Again, plans are still coming together, uh, but the general idea is to gather early morning around 9 a.m. Um, at the offices of the ICBC on 42nd Street and 6th, Ave and 6th Avenue. Um, our Ugandan comrades have really wanted to take advantage of our time together to really push China to stop funding the pipeline. So we will start our action there. Um, but then from there, we're going to head to our main target, um, just a few blocks down 6th Avenue. Um, and we're still working out the logistics, um, but it's a short walk um, to the headquarters of AIG to tell them to back off of ECOP. Um, it's important to note um, that we will hopefully have a sister action happening at AIG's headquarters in London on the same day. Um, so this is going to be a very international action. Um, and there will be opportunities for, for people who have prepared ahead of time to get arrested at this action, as well as for those who cannot get arrested or do not want to get arrested. Um, we will have it set up in that way. So tonight is really an organizing moment. Um, right now, we're going to break into our groups um, Jeff has created some breakout groups that you will join in a second. Um, reminder that our, our drum comrades will stay in the main room um, for interpretation purposes, but everyone else should proceed to their own room. Um, and I'll ask Jeff to come on in a second just to explain the break, the break, how the how he set up the breakout rooms. Um, we're going to be in breakouts for 10 minutes, um, and we want to reflect on the following questions. And um, I'm going to move the slide so we see if we can move the slide. All right, so um, these are the, the questions that we that we want you to think about. Um, you know, what excites you about what you've heard about the days of action? What questions do you still have? And what do you need to make this event fun and accessible? Um, so we want you to put on your organizing caps and think about your community and who you would like to invite to these days of action. And if your group has some ideas that you would like to bring about to the days, please talk about it. Um, and we will have a little time um, before we close to hear from some folks. So um, I am going to um, just jump right in. Jeff, do you want to just explain? Um, you want to open up the breakout rooms and then explain what people need to do? Yeah, so you can click on the room. Thanks, everyone. And just really excited to be up there and a couple of weeks with everyone in New York. Um, and so excited that people are coming in. So if you look at the rooms, um, we sort of did the best. You can choose a room and enter it. Um, I also put three rooms at the end in case like you have a couple comrades or and you want to get your own room to meet there. But basically divided it into 350 local groups coming from out of town, the New Yorkers together, the Ugandan diaspora, um, Chinese, what's called Chinese Student Alliance, um, and M for BL, Movement for Black Lives. So you can, you ought to be able to 
click on the room and enter. Does that work? I'm just making sure I did that right. Did uh, you set it up as they can all, um, people can join as they want? So yes. You should, so yeah. you, it says join, so you can join the room that makes sense for you. Um, and if I did it wrong, if you want to do a breakout, then you can pick room 12, 13, or 14 and do it for yourself. And if you're not one of the groups listed, you can come in and we'll ha help you out in other groups and individuals. Like I saw someone from West Virginia. Um, so yeah, feel free if you're an individual to join that room as well. But that's sort of what we did imperfect, but we thought these rough groupings would make some sense. Thank you everyone for taking some time to be in your groups. I'm actually gonna invite maybe um, two or three um, groups if we have time. We have eight minutes left before closing. So um, I, I wanna see if maybe someone from the drum room wanted to come off of mute um, and share um, anything that you were talking about in your room, what excited you, um, yeah, what you're thinking about. And if, if not, it's okay, we can find, ask another group. Maybe while you're thinking, is there another group that wants to come off of mute and share some of what their excitements or questions or ideas? And can I pick on maybe Evan? Evan from 350 Massachusetts, do you wanna uh, say anything that was talked about in your group? All right, brother, come on in. Yeah, hey everyone, my name is Evan, 350 Mass. Uh, a lot of the discussion in our group uh, was about transportation. How do we get a lot of people down? Um, and had some good exchange of ideas around trains and some good unanswered questions around buses. And then one of the big asks was just more materials to share this story with folks who aren't as familiar with this campaign. Uh, Nico, what you already shared, has been really helpful, really motivating. Um, but yeah, the more media, videos, shareable images, things like that will help motivate a lot of our folks to get excited and get involved. Thank you, Comrade Evan. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, anyone from the Brooklyn group and the Brooklyn and NYC group want to share anything about what you're thinking about? Maybe I can call on. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Molly. <laughs> okay. Um, but we just had so many ideas because there's so many different ways to connect to why this is important. And um, so that was, you know, both for the upcoming actions and a long-term campaign and people had lots of creative ideas and also made us think about the art build on the 25th and what we want to think about in terms of what imagery might be good and um, how we can start to maybe before the 25th happens, have some collaboration around that if, if people have ideas. Thank you, Molly. Um, Tony uh, from the Ugandan group, do you want to just come and let us know if there was anything interesting you guys were thinking about or exciting? Or Ethel, Ethel, I know you're there. I was just talking with you a second ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, amazing, but 10 minutes is kind of the short time. <laughs> so, um, but um, what we were what we really wanted to get at is how we can maximize, uh, you know, the people, the uh, the great group of people that we're going to meet. How we? Hope oh, you went on mute there, Ethel. Ethel, you you accidentally muted yourself. Um, but uh, there we go, Ethel. Did you hear me? You went on mute, but say it. Say it, let it finish your thought. Oh, name I'm on I'm on a meeting. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Somebody called me and I got off. Uh, I don't know how how much did you hear? <laughs> oh, you were just kind of starting a little bit about what you were all. Are. Yeah, we were just excited. Um, we were getting to speak about how we can maximize uh, 
you know, the group of people we are among, um, uh, but the very, uh, the diversity and everything, uh, just how we can maximize it to, uh, to get our point across, which is. Beautiful. And Ethel has done so much mobilizing with the Ugandan comrades in, in Boston. So really appreciate you. And always looking forward to seeing you. Um, and is, does Drum, anyone from Drum want to um, share any anything y'all were thinking about? And then we'll wrap up. Yeah, I'll I'll jump in, Nico. Hi, everyone. Very good to see you. Um, I'm Al with Drum. And um, a lot of us are here because we have been inspired by the comrades in Uganda and Tanzania um, who are fighting um, not just about the pipeline, but about their lives and their people. Um, for some of us, this information is newer. And so um, getting to hear from each other and connect the struggles and the ways in which not only our our peoples are under attack, but also how we are organizing um, has been really meaningful and powerful for us. Um, we are also thinking about, um, in addition to the action in July 25th and 26th, the actions um, in the summer of heat for later in the summer around the justice for displaced people and migrants. Um, which is something that DRUM is um, anchoring with other organizations. And so thinking about how we think about people who've had to be displaced because of the climate crisis and corporations and such. And so we're excited to continue to, um, again, draw these lines, build solidarity, and really um, strengthen our movements to, to end um, the corporations and imperialism as other comrades have already said so very good to be doing this with you all thank you always always bring the fire al um appreciate you and appreciate all the organizing you've done too um so we're going to end now comrades um thank you all for your time remember um well obviously we'll hope to see all of you july 25th and or july 26th um hopefully you can make it to both days um, and then um, remember to be in touch with your organizational contacts um, for information, um, for more updated information. For the 350 local groups, we'll be in touch. We're hearing, you know, questions around needs for housing and transportation. We'll be in touch in the coming weeks to figure, help you all figure that out. Um, you know, and just really appreciating everyone. I want to give a big thank you to Nipa, uh, Kazi, Rawa and um, and Mohiba for our interpretation tonight was excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, and uh, thank you to, to Candace for the great timekeeping and Jeff for doing these breakout rooms. Um, and to like all of our speakers um, and all of our coalition, this is a beautiful coalition coming together. And it's, uh, it's just like every time it's just more and more uh, getting more and more exciting. So, um, yeah, thank you all, and we will be in touch. And I love all those balloons, Russ. <laughs> all right, take care.